Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to see you all here today and allow me to get my slides together, but I wanna welcome you to the, I guess we're now on the 35th gathering of the housing market update. And in doing so, I uh, wanted to acknowledge that we've got a couple things happening. Wanna make sure you know that we will uh, record this and also please submit any questions that you have. We'll be listening and I'll keep track of them as we go. Wanted also to make sure that you know that our organization continues to evolve, change, and we're doing our very best to try to figure out what in heaven's name is going on in the world and in housing and the economy. And we're gonna talk about that today. And our advisory team, which has a little bit of a summary here, is here to help. And we have been very active lately, as you can imagine, in the multifamily space and the build to rent space. And in doing so, we're supported by an incredible amount of research. That center part of this slide is our enterprise. It's really our setup and combination of the former Metro study and Myers research information. And that's beautiful and a great base for home building and land development. On the left-hand side, that's our building product pro. Those are for BPMs. It translates a lot of our data into the BPM side and is very usable for the BPM side of our business. And on the right-hand side, we've got mortgage pro, which allows the mortgage side of the world to secure more builder business. And we are pleased to tell you that we continue to push technology. And it is a pleasure to tell you a little bit about Livable and Zonda Virtual. On the left-hand side, Livable, which is our former Buzz Buzz home, is the largest online new home. Notice it says new home listing destination. It's free, it's free, it's free, and you'll create leads and it focuses on new construction. On the right-hand side, we've got Zonda Virtual, and this is helping builders with 3D designs of site maps and home renderings and digital sales centers. It is really cool stuff, please check into it. Karen Bonder is, by the way, the one to talk to directly. She knows more than I could ever know about those programs. And of course, one of the, the three legs of the, the Zonda program, of course, you know, we have advisory and data, but it's these engagements. And on the left-hand side, you can see multifamily connections and multifamily conference, which is next week in Vegas, future place week after next in Dallas. Please, Look online, sign up and join us. It's going to be an incredible program, as will MFE and Build a Prop Tech. But notice this Architect Live that's going to be in Washington, D.C. I'm going to give you a little hint here. Uh, if you use the discount code of Outlook, you'll get a significant discount. We want you there that bad. So register at zondahome.com events, and we would love to see you there. All right, let's move on. Let, ooh, Ali, sorry about that. I jumped a little ahead. Today's agenda, we, <laughs> we have a lot to talk about and we will do our best to dive into each of these nine factors, but allow me to tie the agenda into Ali's introduction. Now, as you know, Ali is our chief economist and as the market has shifted, Ali has been covering more and more geographies as she's speaking and meeting with our clients. In fact, I asked her today how many states she's covered in the last probably three months, and it's somewhere around 10 states and 20 metro areas where she's parachuted in, met with teams, and she's really leading the change or the charge to determine what are the key questions that the market is asking and what are the concerns. And then she's working with the Zonda team to address those factors and to code whatever those issues are. And today you're gonna to see the efforts manifest themselves in this nine part presentation. Ali will take the first three and talk about the economy and regions. I'll take the next five and talk about housing, buyers, and what's happening with the future and our final thoughts. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to bring to the virtual stage, my associate and dear friend, Ali Wolf. Ali, please take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. And I'm excited to go through today's presentation because we have a lot of ground to cover. Now, if you guys remember the last time we met in July, my first section was labeled the economy and the R word. And today I want it to be the economy and Fed policy, because that's going to be the main focus of where we'll spend the first handful of minutes in today's presentation.
Now, as we think about what is happening with the wider economy, we're in a very dynamic place right now, where as we look at inflation, that has been one of the key issues that we've talked about many of the times that we've met here today. The fact that the different key ways to look at inflation, whether that's the consumer price index or the personal consumption expenditures index, is telling us that inflation is up between 6 and 8% compared to where it was last year. When we met in July, I talked about how there were some signs that made me believe that we were probably past peak inflation. And since then, we have seen those year-over-year -year numbers improve. Month-over-month -month has improved as well. But we have gone to a place where inflation was averaging somewhere to the tune of over 9% year-over-year. Where we are today for the Consumer Price Index, we're still up about 8%. And the reason we bring this up is because this is the crux of what is changing and what is happening and why we're seeing so many policy changes on the ground today related to the Federal Reserve's dual mandate. So many of you remember, I believe it was in the 70s, the Federal Reserve was given this dual mandate from Congress to ensure price stability and maximum employment. If you look at the labor market today, remember, this is a very lagging indicator, but it does tell you some current stats that tells us our unemployment rate right now is at 3.7%. That's an uptick from where we were the prior month, but the reason that went up was mostly related to more people returning to the labor force. So that's an okay reason to see that number increase, and I think most Federal Reserve officials believe that they've hit that maximum employment number. The problem now is, of course, we're still continuing on with these price stability questions. And one thing that I should have told you before we went into this section is this is probably not the most uplifting section. I think this has a lot of stats and data and ways to look at the market that we should be looking at, but not all of it is going to be great news about what might happen. Because ultimately what the Federal Reserve is doing is Jerome Powell has come out and he's basically said requiring a restrictive policy stance for some time is necessary to help keep inflation under control. And even as we see some sectors slow, housing being notably one of them, the historical record cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. And we saw something similar from Loretta Mester, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland president, who said the Fed has more work to do in order to get inflation under control. This will entail further rate increases to tighten financial conditions. And what the Fed has come out and said was, if we have to push unemployment up a little bit, we'll have to sustain uh, an unemployment rate that maybe gets closer to 5%. And that's something that they're willing to do in order to get inflation under control. They're taking this very seriously. And this is interesting timing because when we, when we, when we met in July, we met the day the Federal Reserve raised short-term interest rates. Today, we're meeting a day before the Federal Reserve raises short-term interest rates. The expectation is 75 basis points. Again, this will be the fifth short-term rate increase. I know at this point, I've been very, very specific about making sure you know the difference between the 10-year treasury and the relationship and the federal funds rate. But this is an important number to watch. We don't think the Federal Reserve will surprise. We don't think we're going to see 100 basis points. 75 feels like that's been well communicated. And I think the Federal Reserve is also trying to not shock the system. Now, as we anticipate to see this additional rate increase, we also have more changes that are happening to the balance sheet. And so on this slide, bear with me if you know this very well. I think most people aren't entirely familiar with some of the changes that have happened related to quantitative easing and quantitative tightening. I'm gonna go through this side similarly to how I did in July when I talked about inflation, stagflation, deflation, and disinflation. While that those were and still are key terms to understand, the same thing applies to quantitative easing, tapering, and quantitative tightening. So if you think back to the economy that we came from, we had the pandemic recession when Tim and I were meeting every single week on this webinar, and we were throwing out the D word, depression. We were saying that there is some fear that the economy is going to fall really deep, really fast, and it did. But we also had policymakers respond with aggressive changes, both from the monetary side and the fiscal side, trillions of dollars pushed into the economy. And one of the ways that they did this was through quantitative easing. 
So as a reminder, that's an introduction of new money into the money supply by a central bank. Essentially, the Fed buys bonds and mortgage-backed securities, and as they act as a basically a buyer of last resort, they were able to push interest rates down, and we know what that did to overall stimulate the economy. Now, we saw quantitative easing, otherwise known as QE, following the great financial crisis. What we're talking about now is how we've seen it during the pandemic. We doubled the balance sheet since the start of the pandemic. So take a look at this timeline. We have had QE before. The extent to which we've had QE this cycle is very dramatic. This is the total number of assets held by the Federal Reserve. And I think one of the criticisms that's going around is, well, why did they continue to be so supportive and so stimulative to an economy that was already strong? One of the things that the Federal Reserve is really focused on is making sure that they communicate what they're going to do. Like I said earlier, they don't want to shock the system. And what the Federal Reserve wanted to do is once they felt comfortable seeing that the economy was back on track, then they needed to communicate that their intention was to then start tapering. Tapering is throttling of economic stimulus by slowing the pace of overall asset purchases. So Federal Reserve communicated they were going to do that, and then the taper officially started at the end of last year. We know that housing was going gangbusters by this point. The economy was really strong. We had nearly all of the jobs fully recovered. But from their point of view, it was better to slow the growth, but make sure that everything has been communicated in a way that investors wouldn't be surprised. What's happening now, and this started in June of this year, is we're going through quantitative tightening, a contractionary monetary policy tool applied by central banks to decrease the amount of money supply in the economy. What the Fed is doing now is allowing their investments to mature and run off the balance sheet. They're trying to remove money in circulation. They're trying, this is another tool that they have, to get inflation back under control. In doing so, they remove a buyer themselves from the overall market, and generally that pushes interest rates up. When you look at the math, there are Federal Reserve economists who have run the numbers, and they believe that this quantitative tightening where we are right now is equivalent to an additional 25 to 75 basis points of a federal funds increase. So think of it being another short-term rate increase. Now, we started quantitative tightening light earlier this year. I said it was in June. What we saw then this month is we now are at the full extent that the Federal Reserve has communicated. So September 15th, we then doubled the amount that we're letting roll off the balance sheet that we saw in June. And why I bring this up is a couple of reasons. One, we know that this generally puts upward pressure on mortgage rates. We talked about that. One is that we have only gone through QT another time in 2017 to 2019. And the pace at which we did that was half of what we're doing today. So this is an unprecedented level following an unprecedented run-up in the total balance sheet in general. And we at Zonda, we track this. We're watching what's happening with Fed policy. We are not bond experts. We don't have an in-house person focusing on bonds every single day like the likes of maybe Bank of America would. And so I pulled this because as we're looking at this and you say, well, why does this matter to me? What Bank of America says is the greatest threat to the global financial stability right now is these changes and these strains that we're seeing on the treasury market. So as we're looking at this, I think just reminding yourself of QE, taper, QT, and that we're going through QT, and the existence of it right now is adding to some uncertainty when you're trying to forecast where the market might go. Like we said, we know this is already contributing to mortgage rates going high. Uh, I've already mentioned again on today's call to watch that 10-year treasury. If you have been watching it, you probably saw that yesterday we closed at the highest level we've seen since 2011. The resulting impact, of course, is that mortgage rates have continued to go higher. We're back above 6% today. When we're looking at everything that we've talked about so far, though, we're layering it into what are we seeing on the ground in the economy? And this is a straight up copy and paste from the New York Times. And I did it because I thought even for me who looks at this data on a daily regular basis, it was a really good way to get a sense of the moving parts, the different sectors and where they're falling within the economy today. So the top left part is showing you markets that are parts of the market, the economy that are bad and getting better. Top right is good and getting better. Bottom left is bad and getting worse. Bottom right is good and getting worse. 
And as you can see, you have a cluster of those categories that are in that good but getting worse. And I want to remind you that the Fed is doing these policy changes to slow an overheated economy. So we should expect to see some more of those sectors that are in that top category of the good and getting better start to come down to that good but getting worse. And I think some sections, in particular, maybe the building permit side, will fall into that bad and getting worse, depending on how the market progresses. But as we look at this, I think the first thing to take away from this kind of matrix is how many parts of the economy are still in that good territory. I think that's the silver lining to all of this is we do have pretty solid fundamentals, but they should continue to slow. And there are some risks that as we're going through our forecasting process, we're trying to consider. Whether that's the impact of housing, we know that we represent a little under 20% of overall gross domestic product and, and we've flown. Tim will talk about that a little bit more later. We know that there's new supply chain challenges that are expected. We're hearing that talk from the leaders at the Port of Los Angeles that going into the end of this year, we may see a new round of supply chain constraints. And even things like the FedEx CEO coming out and saying that he thinks that we're on track for a global recession. Now, when you hear something like that, remember that FedEx has its own idiosyncratic reasons why they're seeing a change in overall activity relative to their competitors. I don't think that's universal across some of the shipping companies, but it's something that we're not going to ignore when we hear that come from such a large company. But as we know, what's happening on the macro side, I've said this before, it really doesn't matter where you live across the country, you are finding that those higher interest rates will hit blanket across, whether you're in Orlando, whether you're in Cleveland, whether you're in Southern California. But as we look at this, not all consumers have reacted the same, not all markets look the same, and it depends on the time of when we're talking about how people are perceiving what's going on. So I think we all remember very fresh what has happened with the frenzy that even went through the beginning of this year, where there still were those massive bidding wars, consumers removing all of their protections. If you guys remember, we did a presentation where we showed Boise home price appreciation, which was up 80% year over year. I think we all understood that that was unsustainable and unhealthy, and there was this rush to buy. I think that point of frenzy is behind us. And now we're, I think, just starting to come out of the other side of where we have some shock. Shock to the fact that that monthly payment has gone up between 40 and 60% compared to where we were at the end of last year. That record affordability shock where you move the market from fear of missing out to what Tim and I have talked about at our Denver Dealmakers a couple of weeks ago, fear of buying at the top or FOBAT. Tim posted about this on LinkedIn today. When we're looking at that shock factor, that shock factor plays into how much the prices have changed, but also people's perception of the housing market. But we have this third dynamic that I think has become really interesting to watch, which is we now have buyers that are looking for a deal. They're hearing that the market is slow, maybe they've been wanting to purchase, and they're seeing on the ground that with the existence of some standing inventory, we'll talk about that by region a little bit later, there are builders that are resulting in, in finding themselves needing to cut pricing. Now, when we ask builders why they cut prices, our data shows about 30% have. Tim will talk about this more a little bit later. But the answer is either we have a buildup of spec inventory, our competitors cut pricing, or demand has slowed enough that we felt we needed to. Now, as we look at builders cutting pricing, to me, the follow-up question is, well, did that result in an uptick in demand? 40% of builders said yes, 20% of, sorry, of 60% said no. When you look at this and we cut the data, we then said, okay, well, why did 40 say yes and why did 60 say no? The builders that said the price cut did not result in an increase of demand, they were builders that did a very modest price drop, a one, two, three percent. What we're hearing across the country is the more notable price drops, whether that's five, 10, the highest I've heard to date is 20 percent. Those have absolutely resulted in that increase, which to me highlights the price elasticity of overall consumer interest. Besides price cuts, though, we know that those can become dangerous. We know that that can be a vicious cycle when you're looking at the buyers in the backlog. We know a lot of builders are opting instead for those incentives. 75% of builders report increasing use of incentives to us at Zonda. And as we track this in our database, we know that it's options and upgrades money, it's mortgage rate buy downs, extended rate locks. Uh, we're seeing money towards closing costs. With each of those, though, one thing that's become apparent, Tim mentioned that I've been touring across the country a lot lately. One thing that has become apparent is that 
consumers don't know some of the same jargon as we do. And I was talking to a sales lead that said the idea of a mortgage rate buy down, which to us sounds like a great idea because you're addressing that middle category, you're addressing that monthly payment shock is actually not as impactful for some consumers who don't track mortgage rates on a daily basis and aren't fully aware of what that impact is over the life of the loan or over their monthly payment. I think that's where education becomes so important. But as we know, when you're seeing changes in interest rates and changing to affordability, it's not a blanket statement where every buyer is hit the same. We've talked about this in the past, where it's the entry level that are taking the brunt of the impact, move up luxury relocation. These groups have all softened, but they're not as dramatically slower as what we've seen in the entry level market. As we look at that, though, I think one of the challenges that we have with forecasting is layering in what we know to be true today with some of our quantitative research, where we, I've said this many times, a lot of our research across different income levels, across different age groups, across different markets, does still support that while some of the demand was pulled forward, think those second home buyers, uh, some of the investors, a lot of buyers were pushed to the sidelines. And they still have an interest to buy a home, but they're going through what we just talked about on that last side, some of the shock and some of the inability to purchase. But as I've toured, just in the past week, it really stood out to me that I talked to, it's, it's purely qualitative and anecdotal, but I think it's still worth mentioning. I was talking to millennials and there were three that came to my mind. One lived in South Dakota, one lived in Ohio, and one lived in California. And all three of them are renting. All three of them absolutely want to own a home. Two of the three of them have been trying to buy a home, but now they've been moved to the sidelines because of the changes that we've seen. And I think that becomes an opportunity to our market of how do we reach them and how do we get to a point that they do feel like they want to convert to home ownership and that the value is there for them. But like we said, when you're looking at the groups that get hit the hardest, it is that those that I would fall in that entry level or in that um, first time buyer category. When you're looking at that lower price tier, these groups tend to rely more on their income versus their wealth. So that change of the monthly payment does have a more dramatic shock. When we look at the top markets, the ones that stand out to me, I'm sure your eyes went there too, Vegas, Phoenix, Seattle, Sacramento. Those are some of the markets where if you look at the average sales rate per month per community in these different markets in 2019, relative to where they are today, that's where you've seen the most notable pullback in activity. Those are also markets where there have been a lot of relocation buyers, where even the entry level price has gone up a lot. And when you have local buyers that are looking around, they're realizing that affordability has really got stretched. Of the top markets, 23% of them had a sales rate above 2019 when we were looking at that lower third or that entry level. And then we go to the middle third. You can see, again, some markets stand out. Phoenix, Sacramento, Salt Lake City, seeing the most dramatic pullback in what we call the move-up part of the market, that middle third. But look over to the left. Tampa, Jacksonville, Charlotte, LA, Atlanta. You're seeing these markets are still continuing to outperform when you have the existence in some cases of investors, in some cases of buyers that are coming from other markets or buyers that generally are purchasing off of wealth. So middle third market, you have 50% of the top markets that do have that sales rate above 2019. And it's a little bit higher when you get to that upper third. I think as we look at this, we want to weigh the lock-in effect, the fact that 90% of homeowners have a mortgage rate under 5%, with motivations behind purchasing and questions of are people buying homes and doing a cash payment? Or are they financing a little bit of the home, but they have enough cash that they're okay with financing that and doing a larger down payment? I think that's where some of the different buyer groups stand out versus others. So we can talk about different buyer groups, but I think what became absolutely apparent to me over the past couple of months is the regional differences. And so that's where I want to focus the rest of my presentation before I pass it to Tim. So in the bottom right, I'm going to show you the map as we go through each of these different regions. We're going to start from west. We're going to head over to east. We're going to highlight some of the top markets, not all of the top markets. Many of you know at Zonda, we are tracking the actively selling communities of, of most of the major markets and even the secondary markets that you would imagine. What I'm showing you is high-level metro. We can do this down to the zip code. We can do this down to the community level. But I wanted to give you some of the high-level takes. 
as we go through this, I'm going to draw your eyes to the numbers that stand out to me. Different things may stand out to you. You may have different conclusions, but this is the way that I'm looking at the market as Tim and myself and our entire advisory team is trying to make sense of what's happening. So let's start with the Pacific region. And what you're going to see in all of the tables is we're always going to start with that year over year change in the overall average sales rate. Probably no surprise, as we go through most regions, you are going to see numbers that are down year over year. That matches with that record affordability shock. That matches with national new home sales being down between 20 and 30%. That's what we expect. So as we look across the Pacific, you can look at that sales rate change relative to 2019. Many of you know the reason we do this. That was a good, healthy market to us. That's a good barometer of where is the market. As you look down this list, you have LA, Portland, and San Diego that are up compared to 2019. We have Riverside and Sacramento down, and we have San Francisco and Seattle down. I have these as two different animations and two different circles because I think they have two different stories behind what's going on. So if you look at Riverside and you look at Sacramento, what I then want to say is, okay, we know that sales rate has gone down. What are we seeing with quick move-ins? Again, that's QMI, homes that can be moved into within 90 days. Well, relative to 2019, we are actually seeing a bit of a buildup in QMI. Remember that many builders had shifted to a spec building strategy, so you kind of expected this, but nationally, we're right in line with 2019 levels. So we are seeing a little bit of a um, buildup in some of these markets. Not so much the case in San Francisco and Seattle, and that goes back to some of the developmental issues where it's hard to get more homes built because of either a dearth of available inventory or some stricter regulation. As you go down for Riverside and Sacramento, you can look at those total units under construction, 66% increase, 104% increase. Many of those have a buyer attached to them, which is why preserving backlog becomes really important, but it's a different story. If you look at San Francisco and Seattle, and then even head over to LA, you can see each of those markets have those total units under construction actually down year over year. And those are some exceptions across the country. You don't normally see that those total units are down when nationally total units under construction are near an all-time high partly because it's taking longer to get homes built. The key number that I'm watching here in the Pacific region is what's happening with resale inventory. You can see as you look down Riverside and Sacramento, we're still down between 20 and 30%. There are some markets that as we go through this that actually have inventory that's increased. And some of the markets where inventory has increased, it happened quickly. So I'm watching to see if that resale inventory goes up a lot at the same time we have more QMIs and more total units under construction. From my point of view, as you look at this region, Riverside and Sacramento were a couple of the pandemic winners where there was that value proposition to move further out. And now you're having some of those, those decisions being questioned because of how much prices have gone up. So of the region, those are the ones we're watching to say, do we think we'll see more incentives there? Do we think there may be more price cuts? Maybe yes, relative to other markets within the region. Mark Zawistowski, he's one of our vice presidents on our advisory team, and he was talking about Seattle specifically here. He said, we started to see price cuts in the luxury market in June, but even the more affordable submarkets where communities performed well in early summer are finally seeing price cuts. And I think that lines up with really that second row when you have sales rates down compared to 2019 and trying to move some of the product. Then let's move to the Rocky Mountain region. And I will say that we have data for Boise. We don't have it for every one of these categories. So we chose to admit it, but I would have met, I know that the data in Boise does line up with what I'm gonna show you here for Rocky Mountain region. We're gonna show Denver, Vegas, and Salt Lake City. So again, we're flat to down on that year over year basis down across the board compared to 2019. As you look at this data, this region is one of the highest for having the most percent of projects that have incentives. And I think that lines up with the fact that QMI relative to 2019 is notably above where it was heading into the pandemic. Now, you'll notice regional differences where I'm starting with the Pacific region, then Rocky Mountain, and then Southwest. These markets and these trends, while it's going to seem like I'm saying something similar in these markets, wait till we get through the rest of the country. And you're going to see how these do become some unique stories. As we look again at the Rocky Mountain region, look down to total units under construction, very different to what we talked about for San Francisco, Seattle, and LA. We're talking a double digit, high double digit, in some cases, triple digit change in total units under construction. And the one market that now has resale inventory over 2019 levels, Vegas, and not far off with Salt Lake City. So as we're looking at this, and when I talk to people about what are some of the regions that have slowed the most, I generally say the Mountain West and the Pacific region, where we are seeing a bit more inventory and we're seeing more incentives to help move the product.
Tom Hayden, he's one of our experts in the Rocky Mountain region. And what he no noticed was that there's been a notable slowing in housing starts as builders feel out the market. And I think this makes a lot of sense, just trying to realign what we're seeing with starts activity to what we're seeing with sales activity. As we go to the Southwest, it feels almost, you know, it's very interesting to have a title in the top right that says potential inventory glut. And we'll talk through why we're saying that. But as we look here in the Southwest region, you can see year over year, we're down across the board. What I have highlighted here is that two-year change. You are seeing the same thing that we've seen in a couple of those other regions down on that two-year. When you go down and look at a couple of the markets here, we have the biggest drops in Phoenix and Austin. I wanted to take a look at what are we seeing with units under construction. Again, these were pandemic winners. There were a lot of people moving there. There was a lot of demand. The inventory levels were really low. And so a lot of builders were trying to match that demand level. Many of these, like I mentioned before, do have a buyer attached to them. Some of them are spec inventory, but you can see that spec inventory relative to 2019 up in Phoenix, down if you're looking at 2019 for Austin. But these are also a couple of the markets where you are seeing that that resale inventory, we're on a national level, we're still about 30% down. It does become a regional and metro difference where we're looking up 7% in Austin and up 12% in Phoenix. As we look at this, Stephen Hensley is one of our experts here, and he says that base prices are adjusting as buyers and de sellers determine where the new market is. And I think that's what we should expect when you see these kind of dynamics as they all interplay. You start to say, okay, well, maybe for a short period of time, we do find that there's a little bit of a glut or at least a glut of inventory at a given price. And I know that's one thing that Tim is, he always reinforces is if you look at the market and you hit a certain price point, you're not going to find yourself oversupplied. It depends on when the land was bought what the homes were priced at and what were some of the comps in the area. Let's move over. This is where you see a bit of a change. We're going to the Midwest region. This is where I was last week when I was out in Columbus, Ohio. You're going to start to see differences. So year over year change. Yes, we are seeing that overall sales activity is down. When you look at it compared to 2019, we're talking flat to above those 2019 levels. QMI, you are seeing more of the spec building in that market relative to some others. When I was touring around Columbus, I did go to communities that had some standing inventory and it was it was interesting to see it because there actually were at one community, I remember counting five, which in a normal time is very normal, but just in the pandemic times, it feels very different. But as we look at that change in the QMI, it was the builders that had that that were pushing the most incentives. I think you're starting to hear some of the common stories, but they're not overly concerned. I think they're trying to move some of that standing inventory, but there's still that opportunity when you look at that resale inventory compared to where we were in 2019. We're talking day and night compared to those markets that we were saying up six or nine or 10%. In Chicago, we're talking resale inventory still down 50%. And as we looked at the Midwest, what became an interesting discussion point was while the Midwest has gotten a little bit more expensive, many of you know, I'm born and raised in Cleveland, as Cleveland has gotten more expensive relative to itself, and same thing for Detroit and same thing for Minneapolis, even people that are in the northern part of the southeast are actually thinking about heading over to the Midwest region because of that relative value. Here as we go to our second to last region, this one really stands out to me, which is the Southeast. And I know Christine Smale and Sean McCutcheon and Andrew Wilson, some of our local advisors across the Southeast, felt almost embarrassed on some of our calls. Maybe I'm projecting that on them, but everyone else across the country was saying, oh, wow, housing had demand, demand has slowed a lot. And they were saying, but our market kind of feels like it's holding up a lot better than what you guys are talking about. And that's because even on the year over year change, look at that top column. Not every market is down year over year. Then you look at that change to 2019 and you see pretty consistently above those 2019 levels. QMI, we see it above 2019 in two markets, in Jacksonville and in Tampa. And that aligns with also having pretty high levels of total units under construction. But we also layer in that resale inventory and we're trying to see how that counterbalance plays out with more new home product, but still seeing such a, a dearth of inventory on the resale side. Andrew Wilson, he said he believes that the reason the market is outperforming is related to the migration, to the lifestyle components, and the diversified employment that we've seen only diversify more because of work from home. As we look at this, though, I think my biggest 
red flag of a market that is holding up more so than elsewhere in the country is what we're seeing in the change in the monthly payment. As I went through the numbers, it was like, okay, good, good. Sales holding up better, not too much inventory, good, good. When I got to that, you're looking at some of the biggest changes in that monthly payment. So I'm watching this right now. It seems like buyers have been able to absorb this, but that to me is, is a, a, one of the numbers that I'm watching as we move forward. So here, let's move to the last region, which is the Northeast. And as I'm talking to you right now, I am in Philadelphia. And as we look at the data across the Northeast, it's funny because I was talking with a builder here today and I said, hey, you know, I'm presenting regional data today on a webinar. And I said, to be honest, the Northeast is really boring. You know, there's not, it's not, look at that second column. We're not down too much compared to 2019. We're up here in Philadelphia. Inventory is still right around those 2019 levels, a little bit higher in DC. Overall resale inventory, extremely constrained, not too many units under construction. Look at those total, total value numbers, the 3,800, 7,400, 4,400. Think of those relative to the size of these markets and the population. And what the gentleman said is, yeah, it just is a market that generally is more boring, a little bit more stability from a labor market point of view, a little bit more recession proof from that point of view, but also so many constraints on getting new homes built that that's also just making the market just a little bit more stable. Now, what he said ties up with what we saw from Dan Fulton. He's one of our experts in the Northeast that said there are incentives and price cuts to move product today, but also an expectation that price changes in the medium term aren't dramatic because of tight inventory. And that seemed to be what the builder I talked to today said is they said, yeah, sales are slower. And you can see that we are seeing that sales are down, but they said what they're able to do is adjust price and, and incentives pretty quickly. And they have seen that result in an uptick in interest. So with that, that actually took as long as it normally does to get through half the presentation. And Tim, I would like to reintroduce you to go through the, web, the rest. So as you guys know, Tim is our Senior Managing Principal of Advisory, and he oversees our entire custom market study business, including our built to rent focus, master plan community research, and strategy sessions with the nation's largest builders, developers, and land bankers. Now, I often hear people say they don't know how Tim is so good at moderating panels and being an expert on stage. And I'll tell you one of his secrets. Tim is an avid learner. When the day is done, he often unwinds by reading the latest news, opinion piece, or random articles. Tim's student at heart mentality ensures that he's constantly learning and sharing. So Tim? Let me pass it to you. Allie, thank you very much. And I sure wish my mom was here to hear you say that. Thank you. That was a beautiful introduction. I appreciate it. And before you go, I want to make sure everybody caught a couple things. And I want to end with a question, Allie. And I'll give you a hint. It's going to be about what sense has just released. But if you were listening on this last part, I'll go in reverse order. Make sure you noticed that all markets and submarkets are not created equal. Don't buy into the concept of everything's terrible and we're all going to hell. It's simply not true. Look at the resale inventory in Denver, a market that has had price decreases. Houston, the Midwest market, Southeast and Northeast, the resale markets are not only holding up, there's not as much product on the market. Please, please, please take that away and know that that's one of the strengths that we hold on to. And Ali, you, you gave us some pretty good perspective. I'll, I'll jump into a couple of these things as we go further in. But the dynamic market where we do see some prices being cut, and as you mentioned, more significant prices do bring absorption. So uh, elasticity is alive and well. The unprecedented run-up in the balance sheet and the, the QT that's happening. Uh, the communication from the Fed is consistent. You've been saying that for a while. I always ask you that question. So far, they're continuing with it. Jobs are still pretty stable, but it looks like more rate increases are on the horizon. All that being said, the census just released some starts data. I think it came out better than we thought it would. Would you give us your take on that? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And that came out this morning, like you said, and I am never someone to bash anyone's data. So I don't want it to be interpreted like that. But what I would say is Tim and I are on calls on a regular basis. We've already mentioned that we've been flying across the country. We're meeting with builders. We're going to board meetings. We're doing leadership calls. And 
the better than expected result didn't match up, I would say, with what we've heard in those meetings and with what some of our survey data has showed, where we, Tim, you're going to talk about it, so I won't steal your thunder, but where we do anticipate starts to continue to slow and better align up with what we're seeing with overall sales. Uh, the exception being, you know, if the market is not slowing that much, going back to the regional comparisons, you won't see starts slow as dramatically, but just pay attention to the margin of error and see if there are revisions. I suspect it gets revised a little bit lower than what it came out with. I appreciate that, Ali. Ali, thank you again. Thank you for the, the regional comparisons. That was really cool stuff. I had not seen that ahead of time. Really enjoyed that. And thank you to Nick and John for the support. All right, Allie, I'll take it over from here and heard on the street. You know, this whole setup is feeding back to you what we hear from the 250 to 300 builders that we talk to on a monthly basis. I'll summarize it in three words, adjust, protect, and educate. We've got to adjust to the market. The price cuts are real in certain markets. We've got to protect that backlog. And we've got to educate the consumer that there are options out there. Buy downs work, price adjustments are helping. But the fundamental reasons, you're going to hear me say that word three or four times to, today, the fundamental reasons for buying are in place. Now, that last bullet point, uh, if you are a, a person educated in the world of accounting, this is FIFO, first in, first out. Those further out locations are the ones that we're seeing some of the pain. And that's what, what Ali was showing you in the pricing segments in the bottom third of the market, seeing some of the pain. So the question we ask every single time is, you know, how is the volume of gross contract sales? And keep in mind, that's before they have any kind of cancellations. Which direction are you going? Look at the right-hand side of the graphic. The decreasing side is almost 50%. Now, significant decrease is only 18, but the movement is to the right of this graphic. And then as we ask the question about how demand is moving into uh, going forward, look at the far right. It's slower than expected and causing concern. No surprise, but it, it basically just confirms some of the things that Ali was talking about for this market. Now, we, we are shifting and there's no doubt about it. If we'd gone back six months ago, we were absolutely a seller's market, but we're every month we're moving more and more towards the buyer's market. And it's it's moving pretty quickly. You can see the middle segment here where the builders respond, well, we don't know if we're fully in a buyer's market yet, but I think it's safe to say that we are. And we'll continue to see that certainly as interest rates stay higher. And backlog, that's part of that protect element that I talked about. Builders are quickly making adjustments. And you know, if we go back to March, it was just six months ago, where we'd have about 17% of the builders responding saying that they had price increases above 20,000 and another 22% were between 10 and 22,000. So almost 40% were pushing prices pretty aggressively. Look at the right-hand side of this. You can see no price increases taken and lowered base prices, almost a third of our builders lowering base prices. We think that's here for a little bit of time. And again, it's not in every market. We're paying attention to which markets it's in, but know that uh, builders are not afraid of that. And also keep in mind, particularly for the public builders, and I'm not calling any of them out, but they, they had done pretty well in the latter part of 20 and 21. They were at pretty good gross margins. They've got a little bit of flexibility, not that they want to or should give it back, but by lowering prices, they will give a little bit of that back to the market. Now let's talk about a little bit more about prices. And as we think about this from markets last year versus current year, you can see some of the markets that represented some of our fastest moving markets have, are showing, you know, almost all of them 50 to 70% are seeing listings. Now keep in mind, those are resales, resale listings with a price drop. And I expect that to happen simply because I think individuals got pretty aggressive this latter part of 2021 and into early 2022 with prices, just saying, well, everything's selling, let's push it. But some of the markets are a little bit more topsy-turvy. Look at the right-hand side. You know, you can see McAllen, Texas, a smaller market, but, you know, only a 15% drop in uh, the share of listings that are seeing prices go down. And read across the, the, the right-hand side, and notice there's a couple of markets from Chicago here where uh, they're actually have fewer price drops than they did last year. 
And that's an interesting one because Chicago has not been one of our strongest markets. There's been an outflow of population there, but there also hasn't generally been an oversupply. So it's good news for my Illinois family. Thinking about the biggest worries that are out there, take a pause on this and look from top to bottom. But when you look at those bottom five elements, they really have to do with uncertainty and lack of affordability. And that blue line will show you, particularly the bottom line, the bottom segment, rising mortgage rates are the biggest concern. But consumer confidence too, that goes back to that educate theme that I started with. Educating buyers that when you buy in a location that you want to be relatively long-term, you like the school district, you like the services, you love the home. If you're there for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, the initial price probably, give or take a few thousand dollars, won't ultimately matter. Also, when we think about how we're dealing with labor, uh, how are the home builders doing in terms of layoffs? And my personal experience has been that the layoffs we've seen have primarily been in land acquisition. There's been a few in the C-suite, but primarily in the, the land act side of the world. And you can see that you know almost 80% of the builders are saying, eh, not really, we're not planning that. And uh, we're, we're planning very well for the future. So I think ultimately that's good news, but we'll continue to monitor that too. Now, as we think about inventory, this next perspective is a, kind of the question I asked Allie. This gives you the annual starts looking back year over year and the change. So you can see there's some positives and some negatives. Looking at this in and of itself, you'd say, well, the market's not doing too badly. There's a few markets that are way up, you know, a Sarasota. But, you know, Central California, it's adapting. It's down 13%. But keep in mind, this is the backwards look. And this also had the benefit of going back a full year. So part of 2021 in it. So I anticipate with our pullback and starts, which I'll talk about in a second, that we'll see these numbers go red in most of the markets. Again, because builders are being responsible and pulling back. And I think ultimately that is a very positive thing. And we wanted to, we wanted to get their feedback. So here's the question. Do you anticipate slowing down new housing starts? And you can see the increasing number of builders that are saying yes significantly. And some of their comments, you know, future inventory, it's, you know, we're, we need to cut back on starts. We're not panicked, but we have held back on inventory. We've already cut starts to a third of what they were. So we've, we're prepared. But let's also think about what happens going into next year. So we still see that yes, significantly number increasing. And the no number, 15%, you know, I, I think there's still markets that builders feel like they have to keep up. And remember, you know, there are some markets where it's so hard to get entitlements that builders can't take their foot off the gas. They've got to continue to feed the machine for lots simply because it takes so long to get them approved. But let's think about the, the pros and cons of inaction. Uh, what, what are we thinking? You know, what, what do builders think about land acquisition strategies? And for the most part, it's caution. You know, the pausing on deals, almost a quarter of our respondents are seeing that. And we're doing a bunch of work in the land banking side. And I will tell you that, you know, the, the commentary really tracks consistently with what you'll see here from the builders. And right in that being very selective is where I see land acquisition continuing. Uh, and many details or many deals are being delayed. But also look, you know, at the bottom line, we've heard this now for a couple months running, land, stellar, land sellers are still living in March, 2022. And in some markets, I don't know if they will move from this because it's so difficult to get those entitlements. And if there's improvements in the land, you know, it's gonna be a sticky price, but I think it's legitimate for us to expect land to get softer in certain markets and certainly in the outlying areas that we mentioned earlier. Now, a slowing market's not necessarily a bad thing for the supply chain. And uh, my associate, Todd Tomalak, who oversees our VPM segment of our advisory, is watching this very, very closely. And as we pay attention to the PPI or the producer price index, we have saw a massive spike up in 2021 and 2022, but we're seeing a flattening now. And if you talk to most builders, and if you are a builder, I'm sure you know, you know we've seen lumber start to move down. Concrete's in play, rebar's in play. Labor to me is still the biggest challenge. And you know, once that's up, it's hard for that to come down. 
Let's talk briefly about the buyer sentiment and, and affordability. And importantly, what I'm about to share with you is information from Fannie Mae's surveys. And these are surveys of consumers that they do. And as you look at the light purple versus, I guess that'd be a peach or a coral color. What we wanna pay attention to is the good time. That's uh, the, really the light purple. And is it a good time to buy? And you can see since you know the early part of 2021 that started to kind of erode. And that coral color is increasing, which is the indication of a bad time to buy. But let's flip that over and look at, is it a good time to sell? Well, obviously that's a flip side of this, but notice the good time has uh, eroded a little bit. And I think that has a great deal to do with increased interest rates. Because if you look back to about March of 2022, just before the change, that's when we saw the peak response of it's the best time to sell. Also, when we think about what Realtor.com is talking to their buyers about, and keep in mind, this is summer 2022. So I think this was June, July, and August that this information was tested. But really, when you think about it, these are those fundamental reasons for why people want to buy. These are timeless. Look, after so much time at home, we want different features and amenities. That's certainly COVID uh, infused. I want to take advantage of the current market. That's always an attitude, uh, whether market's going up or down. It doesn't meet the needs of my family. And uh, I need a home office. I mean, these are structural things that we can appeal to that fundamentally push people to uh, buy in their new home. Now, which way do we see prices going? And again, this goes back to the Fannie Mae survey. And generally, where do you see home prices in the next 12 months? You know, it's basically a wash. Some think up, some think down. And then how about employed respondents who are worried about losing their job? Well, no, notice that coral color. It's, it's inched up since the beginning of the year. I wouldn't call that a flashing red light, but I think there's certainly more concern that we saw than, than we saw last year. I didn't just say the term flashing red light, and to me, this is the flashing, flashing red light. This speaks to affordability, and whether we're on the rental side of the world or we are selling homes, it comes down to a monthly payment. And when you look at three, these three markets, Vegas, Raleigh, and Columbus, uh, they're at record high ratios. I mean, actually look at Vegas with, you know, a little bit over 40% where it's re that's the requirement of income to mortgage payment. But let's look at a couple of other markets overlaid with those. We, we've added Raleigh and San Francisco. San Francisco needs 60% of their monthly income to afford a single family mortgage. Now that is just mind blowing and dangerous. And why, Ali said, the Midwest starts to look pretty opportune for a place to live because of its affordability. And let's look a little bit in more detail about some of these, uh, the mortgage income. And I see that we have some, uh, I think we put some hieroglyphics at the top. So if any of you have an archeology span degree, you'll know what this says, but ultimately it says monthly mortgage to income ratio. And you can see from 2006 to 2019 to 2022, how it's changed. But look at the, the bottom five or six, still at 30% or below. Those are generally acceptable numbers, both for underwriting mortgages, but also for affordability. So even with this increase in prices, we still have a variety of markets that based on income are still very reasonable. And I think it's fair to say that in general, you know, our affordability is down regardless of location, but let's dive a little bit deeper into this. We created our own affordability ratio. We call it Zara, Zonda Affordability Ratio. And what we've tried to do is not only include the incomes from the local market, but also we've looked at the higher incomes from where people are migrating in, because that gives us more flexibility and more price elasticity. But you can still you can still see that in certain markets, you know, we've we've seen a decrease in affordability. But still, you know, when we're talking about 50% of the, ha the households, up to 70% of the households, as shown on this left side of the graphic, can't afford the median priced home, that's not too bad. However, there are some other markets where it's gotten to a pretty scary place. Now we're at 50% down to about you know, 12 or 15%, reading left to right, Austin, Orlando, Tampa. So again, what, what will impact this will be the incomes of immigrants in migrants, but also what happens with wages. Now, 
One of the things the media screams about is uh, what's happened to listings and what's happened to the amount of homes on the market. All I can say is that more listings for the resale homes are better. That means more affordable housing. And look at the red line and it gives you a percent of homes that have been sold by year above list price. We're starting to see that decline. I think we hit a, about a 55% peak this year. We're now in the 35%. We're almost back to where we were in 2020. This means for the homes that are on the market, in the resale market, they are more affordable. And then the pending sales under contract within two weeks, you know, something that gets to the market and it's absorbed right away. That's slowing. That's also good. That's, a, a, that's market health, ultimately, because it is, it is ultimately what allows us to pick and choose and puts a downward pressure on price. A couple last things about the larger pocket buyers. And this is something to think about if you're in an international city, because we just use the, the Chinese buyers as an example. Where do they look for potential relocation? And here are the top markets, one through 10. Notice the United States is at the top of that. Well, furthermore, as we dive into the United States, which markets, you know, which ones do they look at as likely places to relocate and also to bring their wealth? So California, Texas, Florida, in spite of some of the, the softness we've seen, you know, that's certainly good news long term. And if you listen to dem demographers and, you know, great economists like Peter Zihan, Peter Zihan quickly points out that over the next 10 years, the demographics in many of the outlying world are going to weaken, and we will be a beacon of hope for both economics and for families. And so that, that longer term demand plays well. And as an example, just think about Las Vegas with 38 to 40 million visitors a year. What that means is that's 38, say on average, 38 million sets of eyes that could potentially buy a home. And if you apply a capture rate of 0.0001%, to that 38 million visitors, that's 3,800 homes a year that could be potentially sold. So visitors matter. And what we are paying attention to flippers and the way to interpret this is simply the peak at whenever the peak was over the last 20 years and where we are in first quarter 2022, you can see Atlanta and Phoenix are generally at their peak and the rest of the markets are close. The number you see there is the year over year change. But we're watching this because that could see uh, an influx of additional supply. So ultimately, as we look at you know the the fact that there are investors out there, well, there was a big <laughs> there was a big article uh, with one of our largest aggregators, Blackstone, saying, you know what, we're still going to buy, but we are pausing purchasing in a wide variety of cities, and they effectively Blackstone blacklisted some of these cities at least for a while. And I think I can make arguments for a number of these as go forward opportunities, but you know that they've got automatic ways of looking at these markets. And ultimately this means they're pulling back from buying and some of the concern about investors maybe is, is limited by the lack of interest that they have. And build to rent, many builders are thinking about this, but my one suggestion for all of you, if you're thinking about a pivot to build to rent, be intentional. What I mean by that is make sure you go into it, planning it to be built to rent. Think about the demographics. Think about the renter. Think about the reasonable rents. Because if you pivot from for sale and just go, ah, we'll rent it, you might not have an aggregator to buy it, or you might not have the appropriate renter profile that you need. All right, we'll put together our final thoughts. Got a couple fun and interesting things for you. Check this out. In the beautiful state of Missouri, where I was born, McBride's had Crestwood Crossing Community released and they had a camp out, a camp out nowadays. Check into it, it's fascinating. It's called Crestwood Community and it's in Crestwood, Missouri. A water-based gel could soon be used to replace damaged knee cartilage. Uh, you may not know this, but I have I had my knee replaced a number of months ago. Uh, this is a very important thing for many of us ex-athletes and interesting as we think about aging and what we can do keeping our bodies healthy. Tony Hawk, who used to live in my neighborhood, has got a foundation to build a world-class skate park on an Apache reservation. Incredible opportunity for underprivileged kids to do some really cool things. Two of my kids are skateboarders 
It's an amazing and very healthy activity, but just wear your helmet. Also, a dog was missing. Cavers found this poor puppy two months later in a 500 foot underground cave. The dog made it, probably was eating whatever it could find and was brought back to its family. I'm a dog lover, I had to throw that in, sorry everybody. And also we're rapidly increasing a push to seaweed farming because of all the opportunities that seaweed gives for both food and pharmaceuticals. And the coral cover of the Great Barrier Reef it's grown back to record levels despite growth. And I, I point that out because there's such a concern about global warming, climate change and the like. Anytime that we see some kind of revitalization, I wanna point it out. So we'll close with inspiration. And when you think about, you know, how do you convince workers to live, work and play in a rural city, 45 miles Southeast of Des Moines? I mean, that's hard enough to get them in the inner cities. And remember what we just talked about with the impact COVID had, well, Pella is doing it, and I welcome you to dig into what Pella is doing in the city of Pella, and they're creating a company town, not that anybody else can't live there, they can, but they're creating a company town, trying to make it wonderful and a great place for families, individuals, people that are towards the latter part of their career, just trying to create the new town. And uh, I, I point out Pella because it, you probably know this, but they are quite a beautiful manufacturer of windows, but creating the city of Pella, I think we can learn a lot from. With that, ladies and gentlemen, it is the top of the hour. Allie and I, thank you very much for being with us today. The recording will be available by tomorrow, and please keep the questions coming. We pay attention to them, and we'll include them in our content next time. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Val and Amanda. That's a wrap. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.